So what I'm going to do here is um, talk through etcd05, which is the next major release of etcd. Um, this isn't uh, this isn't like a bullet point by bullet point talk. So if you have questions while I go along, please um, please ask. Essentially, I just want to talk through kind of the considerations that we took as we we're um, figuring out what what we wanted to accomplish, um, and uh, and the things that we did to um, to fix problems. So. Uh, yeah, interactive, ask question. The, the first piece that we've changed in um, etcd is we, uh, based on a lot of time that we spent uh, working with users and debugging their problems, is we switched up how configuration is done, um, particularly configuration at initial cluster bootstrap time. So uh, in 04 and earlier of etcd, we had this idea that you, um, the user were, would manually do the, the first master election of etcd. What this meant in practice was that you had um, you had one node that was special in that it was the, the initial master, so it had no additional peers that it was supposed to talk to. And then one by one, you join machines to this initial master. So you'd start with a one node cluster, then you go to a two node cluster, you go to a three node cluster. Um, we found this troublesome for a few reasons. The first is people would oftentimes spin up a one node cluster, um, join a, a second node to it, which expands it, the um, the number of members required uh, for quorum to two. And then they'd shoot that node, and then they'd try to add a third, uh, which means that that third node's not going to be able to join. There's not enough quorum to actually start um, building consensus or to have a, a consensus round. Um, so we've, we've had to go through and debug this with a number of users. So what we decided to do was have a fully static initial bootstrap. So you define ahead of time um, the the three or five nodes that you want to have in your cluster uh, via uh, flag. So you say peer one is this, peer two is this IP import, the peer three is this IP import. Um, the nice thing about that is that the initial master election is taken care of by etcd through its same process that it always takes. Um, so that, that's the major change is this initial bootstrap process. Um, if you're using the discovery service, which we find a lot of people are, um, the discovery service is sort of this etcd in the cloud um, that helps you bootstrap other etcd clusters. It's very convenient if you're using a cloud provider where you don't know the IPs and ports ahead of time. Um, that process is essentially the same. Um, it's just this initial configuration and bootstrap. Um, is this uh, the right level of sophistication for this talk? How many people are familiar with etcd? OK. Um, so the next thing is uh, we learned um, that we needed to add internal IDs all over the place. So there was two things that we trusted um, that we assumed that users uh, were able to do. Um, the first was assign a unique etcd name everywhere. Um, and this defaults to the host name of the host. We trust implicitly that this name is unique in the cluster up until etcd05, which can be troublesome. Um, People use cloud providers where the host name is not unique. Um, people have local hosts everywhere. Everything's a local host. Um, and so if you have five local hosts talking to each other saying, hey, I'm local host. I'd like to append this raft. I'm like, hey, I'm local host too. That's great. Uh, things break down pretty quickly because everyone's accepting messages from what they think is themselves. Um, so we introduced the concept of a node ID. So every machine has an internal ID um, that is not set by the user. It's set. Um, uh, either through a hash at, at the initial bootstrap or it's set um, when you reconfigure your cluster. The second piece is a cluster ID. So we've also had people who have two etcd clusters that are cruising along just great, and then they introduce this third uh, troublesome node that sort of bridges the two clusters and says, hey, I, I can talk to you, and I'll send raft messages here. And since there's no way of saying, you're not a member of my cluster, um, there's we, we introduced the idea of this cluster ID. So we reject messages if you, whenever you send a message, you say, my peer ID is this, and my cluster ID is this. And we reject if we don't notice, uh, recognize your peer ID or your cluster ID. Um, so this is just levels of safety that we've recognized are required as we've had to help pe people debug um, clusters, real clusters. Uh, the next thing is we, we did a pretty large redo of our wrapped implementation. Um, and we did this for a number of reasons. The first is uh, we wanted to have a raft implementation we could test a lot faster. So this, um, our old tests for raft would 
run on the order of like 30, 40 seconds or so. And that's because we had uh, internally the concept of time. Raft is essentially based on timeouts, right? So not able to talk to node one for a while. OK, well, he was the leader. Somebody has to, based on some timeout, do a master election, et cetera. So internal in this new Raft state machine, the concept of time is completely external to the state machine. We pump through uh, ticks, so it's like a digital clock. Um, you can ramp the tick speed up, et cetera. Um, and we're able to run tests on the ent entire implementation in about a second. And these tests essentially order messages in all possible permutations and pump them through the state machines, um, ensure that things that should be rejected are rejected, ensure that proposals that should be accepted are accepted. Um, so that was one major thing. The other major thing is um, our Raft implementation, we wanted to uh, make it so that people could use a different log format. And we found that a number of projects are really interested in this concept of saying, um, my log format uh, isn't protobufs on a forever pending log. It's a SQL light database. Or it's um, I send emails to somebody else for my log. Um, so we, we abstracted out the, the log idea from our Raft implementation. Now, this is a generic Go Raft implementation. So if anyone needs to uh, actually implement Raft in their own project, uh, you can feel free to pull it off of github.com slash Cora slash etcd slash raft. Um, and there's some docs on how to do it. It's like three function calls to have a working um, Raft implementation in your application. Well, so another interesting thing, as soon as you know, a piece of software encounters the real world and everything is terrible in the real world, disks don't work, disks lose bytes, um, disks go over the network. Uh, you find out that um, your log file is actually susceptible to a number of uh, problems. Um, those so sorts of problems that you encounter are random disk corruption. So somebody's disk will randomly bit flip a single byte or a single um, block. Uh, you'll have problems where uh, when you do a sync, not all those things actually get synced to GIS or uh, partial syncs. So like um, it'll get all the way through the last block. And so based on um, a couple of really esoteric bugs that we hit, we, um, we've added CRC checksums throughout the, um, the wall file. So as the wall goes through, it does a rolling CRC checksum um, of the entire file. So we can verify and reject and error out and give you really terrible messages if the file is ever corrupted based on those CRCs, which protects us from all these classes of issues um, like, like block corruption or, um, or truncation. Um, this is a big one. Uh, this is a feature that a ton of people have asked for. Um, if you're familiar with the etcd uh, protocol, what we do is there's, there's a number of leaders, and then, or there's a leader and there's a number of followers. And um, when you write to a follower, which may, is most likely your local machine, so you're talking on localhost to this machine, it'll redirect you to the IP address. So you'll get a 307 HTTP redirect to say, OK, sorry, your write needs to go over to the current leader. Um, and then your HTTP client needs to follow that request. This is a little confusing for two reasons. First, uh, nobody really likes having to add uh, uh, redirect following to the HTTP code. Um, it's a little confusing because it all works locally if you're running a single node cluster and then you have to follow redirects. The second is that. Um, and this is the most important one, or the more important one, is that we wanted to be able to say, if you're able to talk to the etcd port, then you're able to successfully do the request. Um, so if people are doing like Docker natted networking, uh, where um, they have sort of a really complex network topology, even on a single node machine, um, we can say, oh, okay, your your 10 dot network from your Docker thing, it doesn't know about the the transport network of etcd. All it knows is that, hey, this special port that is mapped into the Docker container um, is able to take etcd requests. And it doesn't ever have to know about the topology of the etcd network. Um, so those requests get handled by the single node. The single node proxies them to the, the leader, and then they go back through. Um, this is actually uh, a fairly often requested feature, and it's really, really confusing for users um, having a redirect to some tin dot that they don't have IP tables access to or they can't access because of netting. Cool. The next feature is proxies. Um, we've talked to a number of people who implement these sorts of uh, things, um, like etcd. 
And one pattern that's sort of emerged is having these layers of proxies that protect the, the primary quorum of the cluster. So we've, imp we've uh, added a package to etcd um, to help people write their own proxies. To, so the, the idea with the proxy is that the proxy um, sits in front of etcd and adds some additional logic. That logic may be rate limiting. It may be aware of your application and the application's um, authentication methods. Uh, it could um, put redu reduced uh, key space access, these sorts of things. So um, this is an idea that we're going to introduced in 05 is uh, making it easier for people to implement a simple proxy that adds some additional functionality on top of the etcd key store and run it as a, as a service um, on, their, on their infrastructure. Cool. I talked about this a little bit. Um, the test suite on etcd has um, increased coverage and reduced the amount of time. Uh, so it used to take around a minute or so on um, Travis to run all of our etcd tests. It's amazing having, as an etcd developer, being able to put up a pull request and have the green light within about 20 seconds or so. Um, the tests run locally on a, on a laptop in about five seconds. And this covers uh, the wrapped implementation. It covers a lot of the, um, the internal API, so the key space implementation, the store, the wall file, et cetera. Um, so we've, we've gotten away from a lot of the more complex and um, time consuming tests that were based on essentially real-time human um, timeouts. That said, I'd really love if uh, the Go runtime added a fake time package. If you're familiar with the Go, Go Playground, you're able to do time.sleep, um, and it actually works. But it's actually done through this uh, nifty trick of front-end JavaScript and um, a terrible hack in the Go runtime. And so they don't actually run your process for like 24 hours. <laughs> like, they run your process, say, OK, you need to go through these state machine transitions. And your browser is the thing that actually waits 24 hours and prints hello world when you do like time.sleep 24 hours. Um, and that would really help with our testing, because we have to guarantee that certain things happen. Um, and having a fake time would, would definitely help. And that is it. You asked no questions, so congratulations. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them about etcd05 or anything related. Yes. Is the migration Yeah, so the migration will, from the 04 log file to the new wall file um, will be uh, automatic when you start up a 05 um, node. It will take the 04 wall file and transition it to a 05 wall file. Yes. Can you say where those uh, fake ticks come from and if that's too where the ticks come from? Oh, the ticks are an internal timer to etcd. So we have a time dot um, after, forget. Anyways, it's like every 100 milliseconds, it pumps a tick through the state machine. And so that's tuned based on um, the, the uh, speed at which the heartbeats are sent through the system. So we, yeah, it's, it's essentially an external time source. And, and that's why we're able to do our testing the way we are, but then also it, it's a nice way because um, we don't have to wake up the kernel all the time either. Um, and we can tune that parameter. Yeah. Uh, what's the API? Oh, yeah. Good point. So we, um, we completely broke the API. It's all protobuf based now. No, <laughs> the API is identical. Um, it's still HTTP, it's still JSON. All your old applications should work. If they don't work, please play around with master. We expect to be releasing an alpha of this soon. Um, but it, we, we, our plan is to remain 100% API compatible with 0 0.4. Um, and we have some ideas on, on improvements, and those will probably be around 0 0.6. People have been had a number of good ideas um, for adding features to etcd. Uh, really, the best thing I can ask for is if people start testing master today. Um, there's, if you're familiar with Foreman, you can just build etcd and then run foreman, and it'll start up a three-node cluster on your laptop. Yeah? OK. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.